Greetings, I'm John Spirit. I'm Arch Ezekiel. Power sucks, but hey, at least we'll have 214 HV amps by the end of this episode. Question mark, question mark, question mark. And welcome to Sky Greg Super Shorts. If you use a natural fluid generator, which I believe was a multi-blog added by this mod pack, you can generate raw oil out of thin air. And by thin air, I mean with lubricant. That raw oil in a distillation tower has a perfect ratio of heavy to light fuel for making diesel. One HV natural fluid generator can make what amounts to 20 millibuckets of diesel per tick. That's 18 HV amps. If you make cetane boosted diesel using tetranitromethane, we can bump that up to 28 HV amps. But if we also use all of that naphtha to make gasoline, the total amount of gasoline we'd get from all of that work would give us 110,000 EU per tick, which is 214 HV amps. You can probably tell that's a lot. Our hopeful goal, and we haven't finished the episode yet, so we don't know yet, but our hopeful goal is to get both the gasoline and the diesel. But if we can at least get the diesel, then we can start automating a bunch of stuff because we'd have enough power all of a sudden. It's crazy how quickly 5 HV amps suddenly turns into nothing, basically. And now it's time to make four distillation towers. This required such an enormous amount of stainless steel to make all of these 96 clean stainless steel casings and HV machine holes and all- everything was bad. We made nine stacks of stainless steel in a recent episode and thought that'd be enough forever, but no. And this is sharing walls. The way the distillation tower works is that if you put a fluid into it and you want the fluids out of it, for every extra fluid you want out of the distillation tower, you need to add another layer and add another fluid output hatch. Since we want four fluids, we want all of these. We need four fluid output hatches, which is four layers. But distillation towers are just one of the many multi-blocks we need to make. We also need to make the large chemical reactor, like four of them, a cracker. And of course, that natural fluid generator I mentioned. One of the major hurdles we have to jump is that to get the large chemical reactor, we need polytetrafluoroethylene. Thankfully, the cracker doesn't need anything nearly as crazy. Oh god, it requires more stainless steel. God, I'm going to die. So much stainless steel. Anyway, I've used lots of our dwindling steel reserves to make all the stuff for the natural fluid generator, except the tesseract. Most of the stuff required for the tesseract is pretty easy. Except for this block of Ender Eye, which is slightly less easy. You need liquid blaze, and the best way to get that is from blaze powder, which you can chemical react sulfur and carbon. We're going to need a lot of carbon, so would it be a good idea for me to automate it? The most convenient way to do it is to centrifuge it from coal dust. To make the blaze powder recipe, I unfortunately need an advanced chemical reactor too, which required more stainless steel, but oh well. Okay, now I can make my blaze powder. Yay! As it happens, the HV chemical bath I need for Eyes of Ender is already here. Behold, a tesseract. By shift right clicking on the core of a Grectech multiblock, you'll get a display. You can shift right click again to just do one layer at a time. Now that we have the natural fluid generator, I can set the program circuit to 3 so that if I supply it with lubricant, it will make me refinery, it'll make me oil. The most convenient way to make lubricant for us is with oil and redstone. And to get oil, I can centrifuge oil sands. I've set up oil sands ore in our simple ore generator line. I'm putting a processing pattern in our existing MV centrifuge to turn that oil sands ore into oil. We've only ever made breweries for our polyethylene system, so I'm making an MV brewery now so that I can automate it. With an export bus and crafting card, lubricant is now entering the fluid generator, but it does need power. We will now observe the natural fluid generator oh, producing wait. its oil. All right, Arch, start it up. I don't know how long it's going to... Yay, oil! We've got oil, and it's already getting pumped into the distillation towers, probably. Okay, oil is, in fact, filling all of these input hatches. All I need to do now is complete the stainless steel um, distillation towers, and they should start running. I said they should start running. Here we go. Yay, now we're getting fluids of all sorts. To make all of the many things we need next, I should probably make a bunch of LV circuits using the new best recipe for microchip processors. I'm just making these in our MV circuit assembler. Oh, this is our MV circuit assembler. Perfect. Great. Hi, Arch. Thanks for helping me make these circuits. Okay, now with a lot of A2 bullshit, we are now desulfurizing all of our sulfuric fluids. Let me explain how. We have another A2 subnet here, which imports from all of the output hatches to place into these various chemical reactors. 
all the chemical reactors have a storage bus with a different filter. We are having some minor trouble with the extraction rate of, well, everything. But mostly the sulfuric naphtha, which is taking forever. We extract the outputs of each of these chemical reactors into another tiny subnet, which has storage buses on four super tanks that hold each fluid, and an electrolyzer that takes the hydrogen sulfide and turns it back into hydrogen. We were struggling with extraction speed of the sulfuric of the completed naphtha, so we added three acceleration cards. Finally, we added two laser nodes, which uh, are set to insert on the tanks for the two types of fuels, heavy and light. And over here, we have a laser node set to stock light fuel and heavy fuel in this advanced mixer. Since this system can produce 20 diesel per tick, that is about 18 extra amps of HV. But if we want to improve that to 28 extra amps, we need tetranitromethane. Many of the basic ingredients for tetranitromethane go down to ultimately having hydrogen. To get maximal hydrogen, we are taking our refinery gas and putting it in a cracker multi-block. Refinery gas can be cracked with steam into severely steam-cracked gas, which can be distilled directly into methane at a 1-1 ratio. The typical recipe for cracking refinery gas, which happens in a chemical reactor, halves the amount of gas, but if you use the cracker multi-block, you get the full amount of cracked gas. It required a bunch of stainless steel, but we did do it, like I said. And now we're cracking refinery gas into severely steam-cracked gas, which we put into this advanced distillery to make methane. The reason we want this methane is that you can turn methane into 8 hydrogen gas relatively quickly in an HV chemical reactor, which we needed a good source of hydrogen, and this is an amazing one. Thanks to this advanced chemical reactor, we now have 800 buckets of methane hydrogen, which is a lot compared to what we had before. Hydrogen can make both methanol and acetic acid. So we have a pattern provider on this MV chemical reactor making methanol with carbon dust, hydrogen gas, and oxygen gas and a pattern provider on this LV chemical reactor using carbon dust, oxygen, and hydrogen to make acetic acid. Methanol and acetic acid together make methyl acetate, so that's going into this basic chemical reactor. Both of these basic chemical reactors are extracting with pumps into a fluid trash can because they make excess water. I don't have a filter on those pumps because you can filter fluid trash cans for free and the basic chemical reactor will refuse to output anything other than water if water is all that's filtered. The methyl acetate was one thing. The other main difficult thing for making tetranitromethane is nitric acid. Nitric acid needs nitrogen dioxide, oxygen, and water. Nitrogen dioxide is the difficult bit because nitric oxide can only be made not with nitrogen and oxygen but with ammonia and oxygen. But since that's terrible and bad and I don't want to do it, we're using a large chemical reactor recipe instead, which uses nitrogen and oxygen. Did I say large chemical reactor? You may be thinking, Jonathan, why did you make an entire new multi-block just to make nitrogen dioxide easier? And the answer was, I didn't want to use more hydrogen to make ammonia. It was going to be terrible. The large chemical reactor is a useful multi-block which takes many multi-step chemical processing recipes and turns them into, oftentimes, a single step chemical processing recipe, and has a few even greater efficiency recipes, I think. Its particular quirk, however, is that it needs polytetrafluoroethylene, otherwise known as PTFE. Polytetrafluoroethylene makes the next tier of plastic, which as it happens is useful for making plastic circuit boards better, but is also used for PTFE pipe casings, which are used in this multi-block, and of course the chemically inert PTFE machine casings. Making the tetrafluoroethylene for polytetrafluoroethylene is not a does not actually require ethylene. The method we used to make it was with chloroform and hydrofluoric acid, but that was a bit of a doozy. And this is Arch's little monstrosity where he made PTFE. The main reason this build was such a mess was not because of all of the chemical reactors we needed, but because all of them were at different tiers of power. Maybe if all of them were at MV, this would have been okay, but the fact that one of them required HV meant that we had to first power the system with MV, and then cry. There's like, so many different random transformers everywhere here, in order to power a wide variety of LV and MV machines. We'll walk our way backward from the tetrafluoroethylene. To get the chloroform for the tetrafluoroethylene, you need methane and chlorine gas. Chlorine gas we are already getting from our system that makes polyethylene and polyvinyl chloride. Originally, to get the methane, we were painstakingly chemical reacting it from hydrogen at a rate of one bucket every 175 seconds, and getting the hydrogen by electrolyzing topaz dust. 
Now that we have methane on Moss, however, Arch can just grab the methane using the laser IO network. So this part of the system, which electrolyzed topaz dust, is now obsolete. To get the hydrofluoric acid, you need hydrogen and fluorine gas. Thankfully, electrolyzing blue topaz dust gives you an equal amount of hydrogen and fluorine. Conveniently, it gives all the necessary oxygen to make the tetrafluoroethylene polytetrafluoroethylene as well. So we make the hydrofluoric acid just directly pulling from the advanced electrolyzer. And then we can make our PTFE. And with the PTFE, we can make all the many, many casings for our large chemical reactors. One of these large chemical reactors is for gasoline, which we'll talk about later in this episode. But this right side chemical reactor is mainly for the nitrogen dioxide and nitric acid. It requires a program circuit of three. We have an LV input hatch for water that's just fueled by a water generator. But in order to multi-use it with AE2, we are using some more subnet bullshit. An ME pattern provider can export into an interface and therefore shove the requirements for a crafting recipe into an AE2 subnetwork. So when we request nitrogen dioxide, one bucket of nitrogen gas and two bucks of oxygen gas are shoved into this interface. A storage bus on one of these input fluid hatches accepts nitrogen, and the other storage bus accepts oxygen. Similarly, when we request nitric acid, it shoves an oxygen gas and nitrogen dioxide. There's already a storage bus partition with oxygen, the other one is partitioned with nitrogen dioxide. To make sure things don't mix in weird bad ways, we make sure to lock crafting until primary crafting result is returned. As you saw just there, the pattern provider made first nitrogen dioxide, then nitric acid. Once you add both your nitric acid and your methyl acetate, you can make your tetranitromethane in an MV chemical reactor, and finally, you can combine that tetranitromethane with diesel. As a result, we now have 20 millibuckets of cetane boosted diesel per tick, which amounts to 28 HV amps. If we were still exporting from this super tank of diesel, we'd have another extra 5 HV amps, but I think it's irrelevant, at least um, in the long run. And in the short run of this episode. Because this is only the first tier of power that we're trying to get. We call this tier of power screw you power. You'll find out what the next tier of power is soon. With our wonderful Screw You Power, we are now making so many electric blast furnaces. We have here an array of eight electric blast furnaces. It was a little bit of a struggle to figure out exactly how to manage this. As you may remember from our original electric blast furnace, some recipes require nitrogen to speed up and some require oxygen. So we just had two LV input hatches for, each flu for the two fluids. But if we want this EBF setup to be able to work long into the future, we need to be able to prepare it to work with other fluids like argon gas and titanium tetrachloride. And we still want it as compact as possible so we don't have to expend money on 5 million billion coil blocks. So we've compressed it as much as Soren and Archly possible. Each EBF absolutely requires its own muffler hatch and maintenance hatch. The muffler hatch because it must go in the center top of the EBF, and the maintenance hatch because it says multi-block sharing disabled. However, objects like input hatches and input buses do not say multi-block sharing disabled when you hover over their tooltips. So that means that in this example, we can have one LV input bus for each set of four EBFs. Meanwhile, we have LV input hatches, one for each set of two EBFs. In order to effectively distribute fluids and items across these various hatches for maximum parallelization, we are using laser I.O. By adjusting the transfer amount and speed, we are forcing laser I.O. to round robin one item to each input hatch back and forth, back and forth, so that it's evenly distributed across all eight EBFs. Similarly, for the fluids, we are transferring at a rate of 50 millibuckets per tick. 50 millibuckets is the smallest increment of any fluid used in any EBF recipe that we've seen so far, including the argon gas recipes. So we're pretty sure that if we, just like in the item case, force round robin, we can evenly distribute the fluids of a recipe into all four fluid hatches and therefore all eight EBFs. Each EBF has its own HV energy hatch and its own HV combustion generator because we have screw you power. We can just do this. And finally, we have two LV output buses in the center of each four EBFs with item pipes, for some reason, that take the items into the ME interface. I say for some reason, but it does just make the most sense. 
we would only be able to so willy-nilly place down eight HV EBFs if we had made if we had made 28 HV amps just now. And I'm realizing that I was going to go on to the next tier of power in this video, and I may have even telegraphed it at the beginning, but it's been so many days making this thing. But the video is like 13 minutes long now. So unfortunately, while I would love to show you how to make gasoline and use that for the next tier of power called Fuck You Power, that's for the next episode. As always, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. We hope you enjoyed!